Can I begin with you? I want a little bit of comment on those numbers that we saw come into and whether we're likely to get any of that money anytime soon. Well, there's been a long back up, uh, backlog of, of water investment in, in both South Africa and in Africa, and it hasn't been prioritized in all these years. Uh, there have been other things that have sort of made the gap. Um, so we, uh, the longer we leave the uh, water gap, the, the harder it becomes to fill it. Yeah. One of the things I've also often wondered about is the fact that it's not so much that there is no water. There is water. Every single year we see millions and millions of gallons of water gushing through our rivers. We're just talking about Cyclone Idai here that is in Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe. Those thousand billion, are they, of water running back into the Indian Ocean. It does appear like we don't learn our lesson. There's very little, if I may say so, you correct me, that's being done to try to uh, keep that water back on the continent. I think there's a lot of effort to do, do dams in Africa. There is? In <laughs> yes. In I want numbers <laughs> on budgets, but go on before so I provide well more in more So in Saharan Africa, we've got the Kati Dam and uh, Sudan. There are dams coming up there to, to reserve the water. But the problem is dams have their own environmental risks. Um, th they do store water, but it is at a big environmental um, pe penalty. Ria, come into the conversation. Uh, again, I think it's it's important that we realise we we living in a in a water scarce environment. So if you yes. look at um, sub-Saharan Africa or SADC region for sure, uh, we know that we're a water scarce area, and I think maybe what we should do is have a more pragmatic view, forward-looking, understanding that we've got population growth, we've got urbanisation at a huge scale in the territory. All of this will put additional strain on the existing infrastructure. Yeah. Um, Coupled to that, proper, proper maintenance of the existing infrastructure and then the, yeah. the proper design and implementation of forward-looking uh, network uh, main distribution yeah. um, is, is very critical. Your thoughts on what's required to be done and whether you are seeing enough effort and resources being uh, set aside to make sure that we build the dams that she says do have risks that are required for us to be able to at least keep what we have. I think we need to, again, it is, it is a combination of governmental uh, Political will yeah. is the one, uh, and I think it is very easy for us to, uh, you know, just accept that water is always available when you open up the tap. Yes. So I think there needs to be a mind shift yeah. uh, from a legislation perspective, surely, uh, but then also as as residents and people that live in this this area yeah. that is rain scarce, yeah. we need to have a new approach towards the way we approach water usage, and that goes linked to legislation, education and probably incentivizing industry at yeah. large yeah. to behave the correct way with yeah. the water scarcity that we've got. I'm going to do a little bit of research. I'm going to try to find out what percentage of uh, African budgets are actually devoted to uh, water, uh, for water projects. Because I do remember years ago, I think about three or four years ago, I interviewed uh, Edna Molewa. She was mm -hmm. uh, then the Minister of Water and Environmental Affairs. And uh, I think then we were saying that South Africa was the 35th, if I'm not mistaken, uh, water scarce country in the world. I don't know where that number lies. Sitting at 39 percent. It's actually getting worse. Yeah, yeah 39, slightly improved. About 39 worse. So yeah. My, yeah. My, my, my sense that actually not enough resources are going into this uh, may well be uh, correct. Exactly. So let's talk about what needs to be done from a private sector perspective. You talked about uh, perhaps incentives being put in place. What kind of incentives? By who? And uh, directed to who? So. I mean, again, I think the easiest way to do this is probably from a, a, a metro or municipal uh, environment. Yeah. They would be able to legislate or bring in new legislation that would, A, incentivize any new development yeah. by introducing grey water management or rain harvesting uh, technologies. Oh, just, just explain for the benefit of people like me, grey water. So grey water is water that's been used for, for instance, when you wash the dishes. Uh -huh. Instead of having it flow into the sewerage system, yes. uh, keep or reserve that water for watering plants, for instance. Yes. So there's multi-use of, of the single source. But can people do that on their own in their homes, perhaps? You it is possible to it do is. your grey wa water system. There are risks associated with it, but what? it is a very good... Uh, the risks are um, you have to use the water quickly and you have to sterilise it properly in oh. order to use it again. But um, th it is a very good way of reusing water and preventing um, wastage um, along the way. Yeah, and around the work that perhaps ought to be done by municipalities, which is where we need to begin again, I can't remember, it was you who did mention that yeah. there's going to be a population explosion yeah. on the African continent. In fact, numbers that I've seen suggest that one in four people in the world in 2100 will be African. And 
the bulk of those people are going to be heading for the urban areas. Absolutely. Okay. What needs to be done? Well, uh, municipalities are in the best position to legislate um, water water resilience. They they have a much more fluid um, process of adapting laws and and making things um, more compliant for for water efficiency. Is law enough though? Is it not a question of education? I remember growing it up years ago, we were told water is life, and this thing grew up within me as I was growing older. In Definitely, education is very beneficial. Um, I think there was a little bit of a lost opportunity with the Cape Town drought because everybody had um, been taught about the, 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 the precarious nature of water yeah. and they had adapted their habits. But very quickly, as soon as the rains fell, um, people slipped. Um, so the, those educational messages have to be reinforced continuously yeah. and it has to be made a sense of urgency. Yeah. I think when people turn on the taps, they don't actually think that in Gauteng, we are getting water from three different watersheds. Absolutely. It's n you know, it might be raining and green outside, yeah. but the water is not coming from here. Yeah. And we need to be very careful and treat it as if it is as precious as drought water. So I said in jest when you were coming in, should uh, people who waste water be uh, sent to jail? Should we criminalize water wastage? It is a very serious thing. I don't know about criminalized, but it's very <laughs> serious. Riyad thought quickly. I think serial <laughs> offenders should be penalized heavily, heavily. Uh, and then again, I think education, as you said, is, is the right way to go. But yeah. then, you know, everybody's got a collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when the water's no longer there, everyone will suffer. So 100%. it is in everyone's best interest yeah. to treat it with urgency it, de it deserves. And if it is the bureaucrats who use our money to try to uh, get that water, we must hold them to account even stronger. Thank you very much, Paul.